to start or should we wait for people to come? Um, uh, 602. Uh, maybe. maybe uh, we are going to start in about three minutes to give people a chance to walk from the other side of San Francisco where the uh, social reception was and uh, or the welcome reception was and we will see you then. I should absolutely be looking to see what the size look like before I start talking. <laughs> Are we there yet? So um, the little hand is, or sorry, the big hand is on uh, five um, minutes after the hour. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, I am Spencer Dawkins, and this is Liz Flynn, um, who Liz does all the um, actual work that has to do with hot RFC, and uh, then you have me. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an IETF activity, so the note, it is uh, under the note well. This is the first chance you've had to look at this slide since the last IETF meeting or, um, or the last um, IETF uh, interim meeting. Uh, if you if you're in a working group that do that, uh, please look at that carefully. This actually will matter more for the rest of the week than it does now because uh, we will not be doing questions and answer or discussion and things like that. Um, but the rest of the week, people will be. Next next slide, please. Uh, this session is being recorded and um, the, uh, the uh, tips here uh, do apply for us as well as uh, as well as uh, 
all the other sessions this week. So just kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, please do uh, sign into the session using uh, Meet Echo, either the Meet Echo Light client or the Meet Echo client, uh, just so that we know who is in the room and uh, how many people in the community uh, are participating in, uh, in Hall RFC. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we just have a list of resources for ITF 117 in San Francisco, um, for the agenda and Meet Echo and other information, and then uh, how to report uh, meeting issues. Uh, uh, link there. Uh, next slide, please. So the ground rules for Hot RC. Hot RC is how you make a request for conversation, which is what the RFC stands for in this room. It's a good way to find IETF people to talk to for various reasons, and we don't uh, care what the reasons are very much. Um, each person gets four minutes from me saying go to me saying please applaud. Uh, at four minutes, we start applauding. Uh, we'll practice that on the next slide before we get started. Um, and if you're presenting and you hear applause, please hand the microphone over. We don't do questions here, so each person who is presenting does uh, is providing follow-up information, uh, and in-person attendees can follow presenters to the bar. Uh, you know, the conversations can start at any time, um, but there are a variety of places that people suggest that you contact them, and uh, we should have those on each uh, set of slides uh, so that you can follow along. Um, we are using the data tracker for all slides. Um, let's practice our, uh, what happens, so what happens at four minutes? Let's get the next slide, please. <laughs> please feel free to not be shy as you are applauding. Um, at least some of the folks that are doing presentations here are first time ITF attendees. Uh, and so this is a pretty cool and uh, brave thing for them to do. And uh, we want to encourage them to reach out to the community and continue to uh, propose interesting work to the IETF uh, in the future. Um, like I say, just don't be shy. And um, so with, with, with having practiced there, let's let the request for conversations begin. Let's see, our first um, present presenter is uh, Hayu Song, who's talking about domain routing and forwarding for end-to-end -end quality of service. Um, Mr. Song. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. And we, we have a timer running down there, so mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about whether All right, we're... thank you very much. Let's get started. Next slide, please. Yes, we are in the era of 5G and 6G. People are all talking about the metaverse. And uh, for the metaverse, we, ha we will have a global reach and internet scale services, um, which involve a lot of court of service sensitive interactive uh, uh, communications uh, with a very high and stringent um, QS requirements. And uh, certainly there, there will be no a single uh, provider can provide such kind of services we have because it involve uh, any uh, many sections of networks and um, you know it uh, has a global reach that must involve multiple service providers and so we believe it's a time to uh, solve this uh, uh, very um, long-lasting end-to-end uh, -end quality of service problem uh, or otherwise we will never have a true um, metaverse with a global reach next slide please so uh, to realize that, we uh, believe that we need to make the domain an explicit uh, entity in the network layer, uh, which is uh, uh, located in the layer 3.5. Um, to make it explicit means it's not just appear in the control plane, but it's also to be, uh, ex uh, to be visible in the forwarding plane. Uh, then we can vi uh, virtualize the entire network into um, uh, um, with uh, uh, each domain uh, acting as a single virtual router. 
So now the uh, board gateway routers become the line card of these virtual routers, and the internet becomes just a switch fabric within this virtual router. So with such simplifi simplification, we will have a very simplified network with uh, uh, manageable entities uh, in this new um, business model to support the metaverse. Next slide. So the, the idea is very simple. Uh, we can uh, just uh, work, uh, make this uh, uh, work on the IPv6 network by introducing a new type of routing header into it. We'll have uh, two different flavors to support that. One is we, we call that the main base routing. Another, we call that the main level source routing. Um, so in this new routing header, we will include the information about the, the next domain on the forwarding path then only the border uh, uh, gateway router will look at this uh, routing header to decide what's the uh, ingress in, uh, uh, address of the next domain, then put that address into the uh, outer IPv6 header. So all the other routers on the path will just based on the uh, IPv6 header to forward, forward the packet. So this is the domain-based routing. Uh, next slide, we will have the the main level source routing. This idea is very similar to the uh, SRV6. We have a list of uh, uh, domains as a uh, forwarding pass. So for each pass, we'll get the ent uh, entry uh, IP address and put that into the outer IPv6 header to use that for forwarding packet. Uh, until it reaches the destination domain, then uh, as that domain, the original uh, destination IP address will be copied to the outer uh, IPv6 header to make the final packet delivery we are we are actually at four minutes so we oh three seconds okay oh, oh i'm sorry i'm sorry then you so, then you get 10 seconds extra because i interrupted okay you. okay sorry. so the benefits of this is we foster a new business model and we have a limited number of ops vested service provider interest and authority of control uh, for each of the uh, domain owner and we also hide the uh, intra-domain routing and forwarding details uh, by the declare it couples the uh, intra-domain routing and the inter-domain inter routing. Uh, and also we can use the same OEM standard tools we use today uh, for this domain level because we virtualize each domain as a single node. So we can have an audible SLA. Next slide. So uh, thank you very much. We'd like to more feedback and the collaboration. Um, so uh, here you can find several uh, publications. Um, you can find more details about this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now. <laughs> my turned red at 30 seconds. Yes, it turned, yes. This, this is my first time with that, with that screen uh, uh, clock timer, sorry. My apologies in advance. Um, so our next person to come up is uh, Pascal and um, Pascal, you were talking about trusted sensors for a greener world, I think. Perfect. Uh, and let us know when you're ready to start. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, this talk is about a trusted sensor. And uh, sensor and network sensor are widely used to monitor uh, environmental safety. Uh, so it's a major topic for scientists, public, and uh, political communities. Uh, you have some example of uh, organization like Track in Paris that monitors the pollution, uh, Tilleray, which is about uh, ra radiation, and EP in the US for many features. Uh, so basically, a trusted sensor is a sensor with uh, tamper-resistant resources. Uh, it should be low cost, very trusted, and uh, for that, uh, based on uh, open uh, technology. And the benefit is uh, trust for collected uh, measures. So next slide, please. So the idea is uh, that you could organize some sort of around secure elements, uh, including uh, name it, uh, that's to say, teleserver with name, server name, uh, providing mutual authentication and uh, secure communication. And so when you talk about trust in payment, you have an EMV bank card or electronic passports. And all that is a, a shift uh, thanks to secure elements that you have in your pocket, like SIM card or bank card. Uh, so you should have internal command for administration, uh, exported command for actuator sensors interactions, and uh, on-demand cryptographic uh, resource uh, authorization. So next slide, please. Uh, 
So this is the first illustration, you have some TCP IP resources and you have a secure element which uh, run a TLS uh, named uh, server. And so for TCP IP over TLS, for some uh, network interface, for example, uh, in, in GitHub, it's a simple, it, it's a shell. It's like the command, it's ASCII command on ending my uh, uh, carrier return and, and life in command. And you can send some command to the secure element in order to initialize ASCII and do some administration stuff. And this is described in a draft uh, called the TLS AC for uh, TLS uh, secure element. And you have other stuff in another draft, which is called uh, Internet of Secure Element, which introduces uh, other stuff in order to download uh, software in Secure Element through TLS. So next slide, please. So exported command means you receive a, sec a command over TLS to the Secure Element, but in this command, you have some prefix, and we, we use a sharp character, for example. And this means the Secure Element will export in clear form this uh, message. And this command will be executed by sensor actuator, which will return a message in a clear form that will be encoded again by the TLS uh, stack. So next slide, please. And on-demand cryptographic resources authorization means you receive a command that is exported to the sensor actuators, like in the next uh, feature, uh, previous features. But name, now the sensor uh, request to the secure element, some cryptographic re resources, for example, the signatures, and then he return a message in a clear form, which is uh, again encrypted by the secure element. So next slide, please. So on uh, uh, YouTube, you have a, a video that shows you this. So you have a Wi-Fi wi interface, you have the TLS secure element, and uh, you have a, a microcontroller. And uh, what you will see, because I mean many, many of you understand twice, you will see what happened in clear form and encrypted form. And what does this uh, small device that uh, it uh, measures temperature and generate on-demand uh, uh, blockchain tra transaction. So next slide, please. So what's the, the, the goal of this presentation? It is to have some collaboration with people interested. There are many things to do to define frameworks, to define network interface, and to yes, define yes. the guidelines. And I'm yes. ready. Thank you. Let's see. Our next next speaker is uh, Chun Shi, uh, talking about uh, on network path validation and a possible solution. And uh, is Chun Si in the room? We can slide that to the end of the talks, I think. So let's do that. And um, so I would invite Adrian to come talk about essential protocols to avoid forced platform association. And um, Adrian is remote. Okay, great, great, cool. Uh, can you see me? Adrian, yes. What, do you want to do a sound check and then let us know when you're ready to start? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Excellent. Then I will start. Uh, Perfect. So uh, this uh, talk is about uh, what would it mean to be intentional about uh, avoiding platform association. We understand uh, the issues with uh, global platforms as intermediaries, the power they have, the lock and they create. And the goal here is to try and find a home within IETF uh, to discuss this problem and come up with appropriate standards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, one of the uh, existing uh, uh, things in, uh, in IETF uh, is uh, the human rights protocol considerations. Next slide, please. Uh, which has this excellent uh, paper uh, about uh, using uh, forced association or freedom of association, I should say, as the human right. Uh, to consider. Uh, unfortunately, uh, HRPC doesn't have a direct protocol uh, power. And so what I'm talking about here is organizing to figure out which protocols are required, again, to be intentional about this issue. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
so uh, to get us all sort of started, I'm not saying this is the only answer. Um, here are uh, the experience my group uh, has had um, uh, so far over the last 10 years of uh, working on this problem. Um, one of them is uh, how do you provide support uh, between service providers as uh, individual entities and users as individual entities if there's no platform in between? Another one is uh, how do you manage authorization or access to data? Uh, and for that, we have uh, a GNAP, Grant Negotiation Associ uh, Authorization Protocol, which uh, is uh, now uh, almost uh, ready for, uh, pretty much ready to go. Um, I mentioned uh, app platforms as, and I'll talk about it for a second, uh, about where that fits in, uh, because self-hosting uh, your authorization server just does not scale. And then uh, we have uh, some uh, experience with being intentional in avoiding platform uh, dominance uh, in India, and in particular, their work on the Beckon protocol. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, again, this isn't obvious at all, but uh, a lot of work on decentralization uh, goes in the direction of self-hosting. And self-hosting itself, uh, I would say, is uh, certainly a, should be an option, but is unnecessary. Uh, app platforms, such as the DigitalOcean one, but there are many others from Apple, Google, and others, uh, they're just not necessarily standardized in how they're accessed, uh, basically uh, allow a direct connection uh, from uh, GitHub or some other repo uh, to a Uh-oh. And we were at 40 sec 45 seconds, I think. <laughs> if, if, if he pops back in, um, we'll, we'll do 45 seconds. Um, I'm sorry. And, Oh, okay. He's uh, back. Yeah. Uh, hey, you have forty-five seconds, and we're we're back. We're backing up to okay. the slide you were on. Right. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, okay. Uh, GNAP, as I mentioned, is a core to our work, and uh, I urge you all to look into it. Um, it. It allows an individual to control the authorization service separately from either the clients or the resource uh, servers they're dealing with. Next slide, please. Uh, the Beckon protocol is more about how to provide an integrated user experience, which the platforms work hard to do, and it's important to have standards for how to sequence between things like payment and discovery and things like that, uh, which the platforms are happy to provide for us if they're in the middle. Uh, next slide, please. And so, again, uh, I'd like to find a home in IETF for this intentional design of a protocol or protocols to prevent platform dominance. And please contact me. We'll start a signal group or whatever. Thank you. I, I would like to uh, especially uh, say we need to get, needed to go wild because uh, of your stop in the middle of the presentation and uh, great recovery. Thank you for that. Our, our, next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Mark, who will be talking about Quick in Space. What an intro. <laughs> OK, next slide. Um, so we're going back to the moon at a pretty fast pace, as you probably know. Hundreds of missions being planned. Um, Space agencies uh, have actually said that there will be Wi-Fi and 5G on planetary bodies, Moon, Mars. Um, and Moon is kind of seconds away in terms of latency. Uh, going to Mars uh, will have the same infrastructure. We'll see, you know, at that time. But uh, Mars is minutes away of latency. Actually, one-way uh, delay is up to 20 minutes. Um, so uh, the space communications have actually essentially two characteristics. There's uh, long delays and 
planned disruption. So you have window where you can talk to the spacecraft in the space, um, you know, at this time, at, uh, to this time, at this frequency, you know, and then the antenna being uh, in the right, you know, set. Um, so the uh, 25 years ago, people uh, at GPL started to, uh, and Vint actually uh, designed the bundle protocol because at that time they thought that IP was not really suitable for space. Um, with the, uh, uh, the new quick, and uh, obviously the main problem was TCP. Uh, over 20 minutes doesn't work well. <laughs> and if you add the handshake of TCP and then handshake of TLS, it's kind of <laughs> going nowhere. But quick does, you know, pretty, uh, you know, all together in, in one trip, uh, round trip. Um, so the idea here is, can you, we use quick in space? Next slide. Um, and it has all the good features I'm not going to talk. Uh, and uh, so the idea is uh, verify if quick could work in space in this kind of environment. We have multiple implementations of quick. This is not an exhaustive list. Next slide. Uh, I talked with uh, Christian Tema, who actually did uh, an implementation of quick called Pico Quick, and within you know almost a you know a week of calendar, he was able to uh, uh, modify his uh, quick stack to make it working for 20 minutes delay. So I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> um, so we're currently working on, you know, having a test bed with Linux VMs and, you know, HTTP client and servers using Quick, uh, using Netem with the delays, introducing delays and uh, testing various uh, uh, Quick stack parameters. And the typical, uh, if you s fix a few timers or a few values, the big one is the in initial RTT, which is the, the priming of the RTT which in current stacks are 200, 300 milliseconds. So for uh, a delay of 20 minutes, doesn't work. It's just uh, never converge. But if you set it correctly, it actually works. So next slide. Um, so results so far, um, one uh, um, implementation seems to be working uh, pretty good. Um, no change in the mechanics of the quick stack. Um, a few things uh, we've been uh, having is, for example, TC uh, the, the, and NetM, the actual uh, module in Linux that helps you to define delays, have a limitation on the CLI for 274 seconds. <laughs> and I, I've been trying, I haven't looked at the code, but I was trying to oh, see. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> And, and let, let, let's, put up, let's put up your last slide so that everybody can see your contact information and your so, asks. Yes, Please come. Uh, cool. You know, if you are interested. Cool. Thank you. Next we have um, GP and uh, talking about the gap between IPv6 user rate and traffic rate. Okay. Next slide, please. So if you do not know the latest progress of IPv6, then first I want to tell you that uh, IPv6 in the last five years finally took off. So the right picture, you know, is from Google and it shows like the number of uh, IPv6 users as a percentage now reach, you know, uh, 40 plus percent. So uh, 40 plus percent of the internet users today can use IPv6. And this is a very big progress and very promising. However, uh, I, today I also want to you know, uh, bring some of the co-water. I'm actually the chair of V6 Ops. And I want to tell people that even though that, you know, we are seeing a number of IPv6 users growing quickly. There are some problems that are uh, hidden, and we need to solve the problem in order to make even better uh, progress. And the problem that 
we perceive is that the the amount of traffic does not match the percentage of user that we have. So we have this formula. Actually, you know, uh, this is my formula. Um, if you think that this formula is wrong, please let me know because again, this is just a theory. Um, we believe that traffic, IPv6 traffic is actually a better uh, KPI than the user because you know if you 100% user but you are not using it then uh, it may not, it doesn't mean anything. Traffic is the real KPI. And we believe that at this moment that if you know IPv6 is 41%, content is 60%, and network connectivity is supposed to be 100%, then you know we should have 20% traffic. However, you know, according to Amsterdam Internet Exchange, they only see 5% traffic. Um, Akamai seeing 16%, Facebook seeing 15%. All these are anecdotal data. If you have data, please let us know. But otherwise, you know, the traffic doesn't match. Next slide, please. And we have uh, some theory why, you know, the IPv6 traffic doesn't match the IPv6 uh, user percentage is because, well, if IPv6 have some header, you know, there's a high packet drop rate. Or overall, even if you don't have a header, the packet drop rate may still higher than uh, IPv4. And as a result, we believe that happy eyeball may, even though the happy eyeball, you know, generally favor IPv6, but if IPv6 have, you know, this problem that we talk about, then it may still uh, select IPv4. And we believe that this is the reason why the traffic does not match the user percentage. Next slide, please. So we want to tell you this uh, problem. We want to tell you this theory. And if you have uh, traffic statistics, we hope that you can provide. For example, if you are an operator, you know your IPv6 user percentage, you know your traffic percentage, so you know you can test the formula that I just showed and tell me whether you know it match reality or not. And also, we want to, this, this is the main thing that we are, we are, we are trying to get. And we are starting in V6 ops, uh, some drafts, to study this, and we hope you can join us. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So uh, we have uh, Altenai uh, talking about path selection and multi tunnel SD WAN. Okay. Hello. Oh, yes, somebody. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. This is my first talk. So, um, this is a, uh, it's a, it's a proposal open for, uh, I mean, it's not a proposal yet. It's uh, something that is a real world problem I've identified and I want feedback to, to decide whether it's worth pursuing or not. Next slide, please. So right now, uh, the clients have many kinds of options to create a path. They could be a tunnel, multiple tunnel, load balance between tunnels, do split traffic, do mask, do IPsec, proprietary tunnels, so many things. Uh, next slide, please. And um, there are multiple ways one can choose. May, uh, some of them is old, uh, traditional, uh, tag-based. Next slide, please. Or maybe some kind of a round robin or some kind of a weighting algorithm, uh, which takes into account the QoS values, like, like here, jitter, latency. Uh, or it has um, rules based on client, like, uh, for example, this client will get this much allocation. Next slide, please. Uh, or maybe the path selection could be based on um, policies, like for example, uh, if the performance goes down below this threshold, then switch to the next tunnel, or if the performance goes below like absolute minimum threshold, then just do split tunnel, something like that. Um, proximity and geo-based rules. These are all uh, proprietary or rather um, decisions that applications make, and it is not standardized. It differs between um, network providers to network providers. Next slide, please. Um, so what we end up with is like this kind of a situation. Uh, there are some machine learning algorithms like NBAR, uh, which make a decision uh, automatically, or some people right now with mask may just put reliable and reliable traffic on the same tunnel. So, um, so next slide, please. So I 
would say maybe there is a, a space to create a standardized algorithm, right? To make this decision making simpler. It's like this. Um, and what would this algorithm do? It can overcome some of the limitations, like the, the use cases which are counterproductive, like added latency when it's not required, um, not traversal nightmares, um, exhausting limited bandwidth provided by VPN providers, because if you uh, put the VoIP traffic on the tunnel, then it's going to exhaust your limited VPN bandwidth. Um, not nested tunneling and double congestion control. I know I've talked to a few people. I know I identified this as a, a valid problem. So uh, an algorithm which selects one or two of the methods and recommends uh, the application to choose may actually uh, prevent this. Next. Um, and what can the algorithm, maybe it's just a suggestion, it's all open to uh, feedback, could take uh, values like network state, vulnerability, uh, time sensitivity, could take carbon footprint, hmm? and uh, all the options that are available, and gives weight, and then um, based on the data points, options, it dynamically calculates the recommended path. Next slide, please. Um, for example, like um, these are examples I uh, may or may not work, but like say for highly latency sensitive applications like gaming, uh, we don't need to put it in a tunnel. Um, but for VoIP, for example, we could put the signaling data through a tunnel and um, the, the media traffic through MOQ, something like that. Next slide, please. Or maybe SIP trunk. So SIP trunks are voluminous calls between two endpoints. We could have a dedicated tunnel for that. Um, and maybe heavy file downloads can benefit from load sharing across multiple tunnels, across um, different ISPs, like a tunnel one on ISP A, tunnel two on ISP B, something like that. Next slide. Um, next slide. Since I have 12 seconds, next slide. Uh, next slide. Seven seconds. Yes, so um, this standardization could also overcome this kind of a heterogeneous network scenario where there's uh, prioritization issues between different kinds of networks. Like standardized algorithm could set the priority right across networks. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's all open for um, feedback. Thank you so much. Good job. Good job. Let's see, inviting uh, John to come up and talk about uh, alternative optimizations for low latency media streaming, um, low latency media handling, sorry. Rose, are you ready? Okay. So in the, in the next couple of minutes, I'll try to go over um, a few areas that get affected as a result of some optimizations in the wireless network to uh, handle low latency media streaming. So this slide, I'll go over the background. Um, since the, to optimize and utilize the bandwidth in wireless networks completely, what wireless networks do is to drop some packets and they don't want to drop it randomly. They want to select a set of packets to drop. The result of this is that, um, you know, this is, uh, and to give you a little bit more is that uh, there are two areas that have been standardized now in 3GPP. That's to use L4S for the longer term loops of 100 milliseconds or so, and selective packet drops that you know, take place in very short periods of time. Um, we are proposing a draft in TSVWG to handle the encrypted media related to this, but that's a separate issue. Uh, as a result of this, we think that there's a couple of areas that we need to probably look at in the transport area and perhaps even the applications area. So I'll go over that in the next two slides. So, um, what 3GPP does now is look at headers in the RTP and then prioritize what uh, is of uh, more importance and uh, drop maybe some that are not of higher importance. And in, in the process, it also keeps a view of what uh, periodicity these frames occur in. But as these uh, media evolves and we go to AI generated content or others, we may end up with non-periodic data. Um, there may be multiple streams that we maybe de need to deal with or uh, separate transport connections. And another dimension of it is that the UDP source of this media may be the client itself for the uploads. All of these relate to problems that the transport may need to look at, the IP transport may need to look at. I'll go to the next slide and introduce the, the other aspects as a result of the 
the set of packets that may be dropped. Uh, RTCP feeds back information to the server, which is then used to for packet pacing and for rate adjustments and related aspects. But when a, a set of packets are dropped, um, what does the server infer? Is, is this a really catastrophic failure or is it not? Um, it should not be. But what the server, I mean, it's not clear what the server will do at this point. Uh, the other aspect is that the wireless network depends on the server not doing anything because it wants to use as much bandwidth as possible and it's available. So all of these affect um, both the applications area and the transport area. And I just wanted to bring that into attention. We'll, we've only begun to look at this. Um, so this is pretty, pretty early. I think the standards are there in wireless um, and uh, this is going to evolve and probably get worse as we get to millimeter wave radio networks and so on. So I think it's a good time for us to start thinking about it. And um, if there are people who are passionate about low latency uh, media and wireless networks, please come and talk to us. Uh, Spencer, uh, Sri, and I are looking at related areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See, do we have uh, Andrew uh, to talk about encrypted client hello deployment considerations? Hello, Andrew. Uh, let us ready. Let us know when you're ready to start. Okay, uh, good evening, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. All right, right. so uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, the, the encrypted client hello uh, mechanism, which is, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, it's an add-on to uh, TLS 1.3 and later protocols to encrypt the uh, client, ho client hello message. Um, it builds on what was previously known as uh, encrypted SNI, um, slightly more, so slightly broader than that, but it's, uh, if you like, the next iteration of that. It's been developed within the uh, TLS uh, working group, uh, and I'll put a link on the side if you're interested, currently at draft 16 uh, for, for that particular activity. Next slide, please. Um, the issue that I wanted to focus on here, though, um, when you encrypt SNI, um, one of the existing RFCs in this space, RFC 8, some Four, four notes that um, uh, surprisingly there are some unanticipated usages of uh, the SNI information um, and it sort of just does a brief assessment of some of those and suggests that they could be realized through other um, means without actually stating what those other means might be um, or the cost of implementation. Uh, the, the reality is that there's a lot of different uses for the SNI data which become challenging to, to uh, continue with if it's um, encrypted, put some on the side, things like antivirus software, parental controls, uh, enterprise firewalls. There's an awful lot of running code which uses uh, the SNI data. Um, and in fact, from some of our discussions, there are a lot of end user groups um, who are becoming extremely concerned uh, uh, about the, the potential implications for their organizations uh, of the encryption of uh, SNI data. Um, so, for example, a lot of Fortune 500 uh, CISOs, uh, amongst others. Next slide, please. Um, so what we've been doing is writing a draft to just document what those deployment considerations are, um, just by sort of teasing out what some of the different use cases are, um, why the use of the SNI data is important um, uh, in, in different contexts, um, and uh, in particular, some of the areas which will have difficulty, such as, for example, support for bring your own device, uh, I mentioned already enterprise security and such like. So we're trying to document them and where possible identify potential mitigations um, as uh, ECH uh, is standardized and begins to be um, deployed. Next slide, please. So uh, just to wrap this up, uh, the purpose for just drawing this to your attention, we have a draft currently at version 06, it would shortly be at version 07. Um, you can find that on the data tracker, the link's on the slide. Um, yeah, there's also a public GitHub if you prefer GitHub to uh, interact and you can uh, put any suggested changes there. Um, and basically, if you want to help 
with uh, sort of documenting some some of these uh, issues to support end users who aren't well represented in this community. Um, then myself, one of my co-authors is, is here, Arno, um, who's just uh, waving there. We're here all week, so please come and talk to us. We'd welcome your, your input uh, as we think it's important to actually help end users um, as we uh, upgrade uh, protocols. Thank you. Excellent. So let's see. Did, um, did we need to go back and check for Chen Shi, is that right? Oh, excellent, excellent. Welcome. So we will be, we will. <laughs> so Chen Chi is uh, going to talk about uh, path validation and the possible solution. And uh, let us know when you're ready to start. Yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, today let's talk about path validation and the possible solution uh, that we propose. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, why do we care about path validation? So what is path validation? It actually comes from the routing security, um, se several attacks. So now we have a routing hijack, we have route injection, we have route uh, leak. And then people start to think, can we have a mechanism that can secure the path of a routing? And then we have the famous BGPSec and RPTI. So that's great, that's great work. But the minor problem is, although like we have like planned a desired path, but the actual, like in the data plane, the traffic could take a completely different path. So it could like take a detour and uh, that it makes a classical like a route injection attack. So in this case, the problem, the minor problem is that um, this BGP stack and all kinds of uh, RPKI control plane mechanisms, it cannot guarantee that the planned path is actually took by the traffic. So what is path validation? So path validation is actually a data plane mechanism that uh, enforce and verify that the traffic has actually took this uh, path that the control plane has secured. So it, it provide a transit proof to complement the, uh, the control plane secure routing mechanisms. So what is path validation? In a word, path validation is a mechanism that ensures data packets to strictly traverse the chosen network path. Now, next slide, please. So uh, consider this use case. So Alice is having a confidential business video meeting or very confidential VIP call. So uh, she wants her uh, information to just only pass these very secure routers, one, two, three, four. So she doesn't want any data of this connection to be detoured and monitored. But here, if we see this uh, router number three, if it takes a detour and takes the traffic to some uh, malicious and silent nodes to a different malicious um, uh, AS, uh, AS, and then this uh, traffic of her uh, video meeting could be dropped, could be monitored, uh, could be collectively crypto analyzed. So this is something that she doesn't want. Next slide, please. Uh, so in here, uh, we propose a mechanism that is based uh, by vector commitment. So vector commitment is very similar to a regular commitment primitive in the cryptographic uh, uh, context. So uh, there are three stages. In here, the controller will select a path and uh, uh, here we can see this route to one, two, three, four, and uh, she will compute a commitment, a cryptographic commitment, a very short, uh, a constant size in here in our case. And then for each router, when they are actually uh, routing this packet, uh, the each router will compute a transit proof. And this transit proof plus the uh, commitment when they are verified against each other, then we can verify that if this router is actually uh, this is the correct router that's forwarding our, our data. So here, the security here is the position binding property. So the security here actually needs three conditions to, to be met. So number one, it is the right, uh, sorry, the transit proof will successfully pass verification if and only if uh, this transit proof was created by the right node. This right node must be in the right position and also must be consistent to what we committed in the very beginning. So three conditions must be met in the same time. And in our construction, we use a KZG commitment, a polynomial commitment, which is used by Ethereum layer two rolling, a roll up, sorry. It's very efficient and there's a constant size of the proof, constant uh, time of proof creation and verification. That's very nice. Uh, and also, next slide, please. Uh, to back to the Alice confidential communication case, uh, if here this traffic takes a detour, then the, the node number four, this malicious node at the incorrect position, a wrong node, wrong position, 
he cannot compute a correct transit proof, and this will alarm the owner and also halting the connection. Next slide, please. So this is the short version. We're working at Grabs. We are looking for joint research. And if you're interested, look for the full presentation of SEC. Thank you. And uh, catch me in the venue. Thank you. Thank you. I think this completes uh, IETF 117 HAL RFC series. Uh, let the conversations uh, begin. And uh, thank you all for coming. I would ask that you uh, take a peek at your ITF 117 uh, participant survey that, that comes out after each IETF meeting. Uh, HAL RFC is on there. And uh, please let the uh, folks who do the surveys know what you think of HAL RFC and if you find it useful. Thank you and uh, have a great week. And other than that, we will see you in November? November. One small suggestion. Please do. All people who are not native English speakers, yes. could you give them an extra minute? Just because it would seem fair if they're.